We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Are, are you able to hear us in the room? Good afternoon, Paul. Yep, we can hear you in the room, Paul. Okay. We can hear okay. you. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we're, we're, we're on time or within a minute of being on time. So <laughs> firstly, uh, welcome to everybody. I'm, my name is Paul Rowney. I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, we have an interesting and dynamic session. It's a follow-on from uh, previous interventions that uh, Effectors had at the IGF, which deals with the uh, digital inclusivity and unlocking the digital potential in the uh, developing and least developed countries. Uh, we have an exciting uh, and well-informed panel. Um, so on that note, I'm, I'm going to quickly hand over the floor to our chair of the FICTA, who's going to give uh, a few words and uh, formally open this session. Uh, Tabo. Thank you, uh, Paul, much appreciated. And uh, good morning to all uh, in this session uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, my name is Tabo Mashekwane. I'm the chair of AFICTA. We are currently running a summit, so uh, it's, it's concurrent to this. And uh, I would like to welcome all in, in the session, panelists, as well as the mod our moderator, uh, as well as all attendees into the session. Um, the session uh, uh, that we are running, which is a workshop 158 on digital inclusivity uh, in developing and least developed countries, uh, it's a very uh, critical uh, workshop uh, in, in, in that it addresses now what we call user connectivity uh, versus content. And within that, I think our panelists are going to address a couple of policy questions. And uh, with those policy questions uh, is to look at uh, the barriers to universal uh, 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 and, and meaningful access, as well as the practical locally driven policy solutions. And, and with that, it's, it's, it's them sharing uh, in terms of their expertise and their experiences as to how to surpass this. And we as AFICTA, uh, uh, as an advocacy uh, group in Africa, we, 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 we very much, uh, this very much uh, lies at, at the core of, of our interests uh, and, and our peoples itself. Uh, I, would, I would like to welcome everyone, uh, especially the, 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 the panelists into, into, into this workshop. And I will give over to uh, our moderator. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, is Inye here? Inye and and Paul. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm. 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 I'm going to moderate this uh, session. Thank you. So, so th th thank you, Tabo. And uh, for those who don't know, Victor is a uh, private sector led uh, organization in Africa that brings together ICT industry professionals and helps frame the policy uh, on the continent. So when you look at our workshop, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, user connectivity versus content, and you, you'll see a deeper dive in this as we move forward. And, you know, we, we are getting connected, although it's still slow, but we are over the 50%. But it's not just about getting co connected, you know, Connection has to be meaningful, but also the content that uh, we have access to has to be meaningful to, to the person that's using it. So on, on, on our panel today, we, we have uh, Issa Ibrahim uh, Jal. Uh, Issa is the director and CEO of Abuja Geographic Information Systems. Uh, welcome, Issa. Thank you very much. Nice to we have, be in this forum. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Melissa Sassi, uh, 
she's in the room. I think she can wave. Melissa, can you wave? <laughs> yep, right uh, here. Thank you, Paul. Melissa is a great friend and supporter uh, of Effector. She is the global head for IBM, Hyper Project Accelerator. Uh, I'm sure she'll give some insight into what that is. Uh, so welcome, Melissa. We have Mary Duma. Uh, Mary is, is well known in the IGF corridors. Uh, she's also a coordinator for the West Africa IGF amongst uh, many hats. I believe Mary is in the room. Mary? I'm here. Welcome, Mary. We also I'm here. have. Uh, th th thank you, Mary. We also have uh, Kulusia Joanna, who is the Assistant Professor of International Law, University Lodz of Poland. Is Kulusia in the room or online? Uh, yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hi, Joanna. Welcome. Uh, Jane Coffin was also part of our panel. Uh, Jane has submitted her apology. Uh, she has an emergency that she needs to attend to, uh, but uh, she will be reading the transcripts and will be available to uh, answer questions uh, if, if there are any that uh, would have been directed uh, towards her. So. Our session uh, is, is driven by uh, two specific policy questions. I'm going to pose uh, these policy questions one at a time to our uh, panelists for their uh, intervention and thoughts. And then after each policy question, we will open the floor for any questions and comments. Uh, we can use the hands up in the room or online. <laughs> this is a nice, you know, we've got used to this hybrid environment. We're all equals, whether we're in the room or uh, on 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 the uh, online. So, please, if you're online, please feel free to enter in the chat or uh, raise your hand on uh, Zoom. And in the room, if you can raise your hand, and then one of our uh, online panelists will will ensure that uh, you get to ask your question. So, I'm I'm going to first uh, pose uh, the first uh, policy question, which is barriers to universal universal and meaningful access. What are the main challenges that people face in obtaining and making full use of internet access? To what extent are these the result of social, economic and cultural factors? And to what extent do they result from aspects of the digital environment? How can we use the response to these questions to better understand the intersection between digital policies and other policy areas? So I'm, I'm going to first pose this in, in, in order of introduction of the speakers. So. Issa, if you can have an intervention on that, please. Issa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, one thing for sure is that internet access also in Africa is still costs some money because most of the access is through the telco operators, the mobile operators. And, and we know that the bandwidth costs some money so there is need for us to improve on that. So it's kind of challenge for because most of the people in the rural areas because their access is through the mobile. And probably this is associated to lack of also uh, fiber connectivity to most of the population. For example, in Nigeria, we have some of the main operators of the provision of on the, on the main operators that are providing access through the fiber, like the main one company that brought the fiber into Lagos, but the connectivity downstream is also an issue where you have some of the operators uh, taking the connectivity to the last mile through uh, macro web links. And this is affecting the ability of the people to connect in terms of cost. And also the connection is not uh, very, very good, even though that is availability of the 4G technology, but this is mostly available in the city areas. In addition also, if there is no content for the people to access, uh, there will be issues in terms of connectivity, even if you have the access, if the content is not there, uh, you cannot access. And the content has to be localized. The content that 
has to do with the local interests of the population. And also there are other cultural barriers that we need to look at, which is preventing people from accessing some of the contents that are out there. But the most important aspect is try to our ability to be try to try and much as, as much as possible to put up content related to uh, information that the local population need, which means that government has a big role to play in terms of policy formulation, in terms of providing the necessary infrastructure, creating the enabling environment for the public sector to now provide the infrastructure also, and then ensuring that there is security in terms of content, security in terms of access. Uh, I know there are other service providers that have improved in terms of connectivity, but we still have a lot to do in that area. Th th thank you, Isa. Okay, I'm posing the same question now to Melissa. Melissa, the floor is yours. Hey, everyone. Um, so Melissa Sassi um, from IBM. And, you know, I have the wonderful opportunity in my role at IBM to um, run student and entrepreneur experience globally within the IBM Z division of IBM. So that leads me to engage with lots of uh, young people. And I think that as we as we look at the, the concept of uh, connectivity or content, I don't think it's about or, it's about and. And one of the things that I, I always say is, um, and it's kind of one of my coin phrases, and that's be an and and not an or. You know, when I look at my own career, I think about what is the intersection of whatever it is I want to be and whoever I am. And it's not about, am I this or am I that? I'm this and that. And, you know, we can go out and build all the connectivity solutions in the world. But if there are not enabling ecosystems to enable people to make meaningful use of the internet, we're building technology for the sake of technology. Um, in, my, in my role, one of the biggest things that I focus on are two separate things. One is uh, enabling students so young people, as well as uh, individuals of all ages to build digital skills. And when I say digital skills, I think part of that is being safe and secure online. So really understanding how do you not just be a, a consumer of technology, but also how do you be a creator, a maker and doer empowered by technology. And I don't think everybody's going to be an engineer. I don't think everybody needs to learn, you know, everything there is about you know, computer science, but regardless of who you are, including all of us in the room, need to understand the basic building blocks of computer science and understand, you know, how things have been built, where have they come from? And I think the, the biggest piece as well, you know, assuming that you've got these digital skills, and I know those are all defined, you know, uh, differently depending upon who you are, um, which I can point you to a good framework that I like. Um, but I think the other piece is how do you drive outcomes? And I look at outcomes in a few different ways. Um, the majority of my focus when I put on my entrepreneur hat at IBM is creating entrepreneurs, enabling entrepreneurs. And this isn't just about how do we bring, you know, Silicon Valley tech bro from uh, Silicon Valley onto the continent or wherever to create a quote unquote local solution. But, you know, how is it that we can, you know, enable through digital skills, through capacity building, through funding, you know, locally grown solutions in local languages. You know, I'll give you a few different examples of the startups that I uh, am personally working with on the continent. Um, so one is uh, Credit Plus out of uh, Uganda, and they provide temporary loans for, you know, cash flow gaps. And this is not about your predator loan that takes advantage of someone who needs support between paycheck to paycheck, but really looking at how do we help the unbanked to manage their bills in a way that is not predatory in nature. Second one is LEAF, which is um, all about virtual banking and savings for migrants. The third one, one of my favorites is Pay Hippo. And they just landed $3 million in funding. They provide small business loans, a 
payback. They reduce the amount of time that it takes for small and medium enterprises on the continent to get access to funds. And then the last one, and I'm sure that many of my startups on the continent right now are like, wait a second, how did I not make the top four? Um, but Wayapay. And they are based out of uh, Kenya and are doing some really interesting things when it comes to cross-border payments. And they are launching um, a challenger bank in the U.S. focused on uh, expats and enabling expats to send money back home. So, again, skills, local content, outcomes such as economic empowerment. Thank you. That, 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 thank you, Melissa. Okay, uh, I'm now passing the floor to Mary and Duma. Mary. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul, for giving me the opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are connecting to us. Uh, when we talk about inclusivity, we are looking holistically what and what uh, would affect uh, my connecting to the internet. Somebody has already raised, raised issue of uh, affordability. I also want to raise the issue of availability. You can afford it, but it's not available. What will make it not to be available? It might be that um, the, the, there's no dial tone around your, your area, or there's no data connectivity around your area. But the fact still remains that we, we have other factors that affect our connectivity, which is the adjacent infrastructure, we know that there's the telecom infrastructure or data infrastructure that we would have, but what of the adjacent infrastructure where you have uh, the dial tone, but you can't charge your device to even connect. So it affects yeah, the connectivity or inclusivity. So that, that's something we should look at. And then I'll also look at when you say availability uh, or accessibility, the content, does it address the need of the people, the need of those in, the, in living in disability? Do we take them into consideration? So that's one of the things. Language, Melissa had already said about language. That is very, very important because um, some will want to connect. Some are, some are you know, uh, indigenous people that will not speak our African language, like the, I mean, the, 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 the um, colonial master's language of English, French, and uh, Portuguese or Arabic. So what do we do? How do we make sure that the, there's language that they, they could meaningfully understand what is happening on the internet? Even when you, you want to do f financial uh, intervention uh, using the, the, the technology, um, if, they, if it is written in the language the, the local people cannot understand, so it becomes a problem. So, and then there's issue of trust. In some of our, of our communities, people don't trust the internet. We had a program in one of our communities in, uh, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, one woman stood up to tell me that, Madam, internet is bad. It's not good for our children. It brings wrong thing. They learn wrong language. They they learn learn you know things that are not our culture. So that brings me back to the education or the skill, the skill, the digital skill training or education. How do we inform the local people that internet is good and they can connect and do some of their businesses? Okay. So and um, somebody has mentioned infrastructure and um, the. The session before now talked about community networks. There's no way we can get the local people connect if there's no data, if there's no connectivity. So we should be looking at where, where, where we, we have uh, infrastructure in terms of local, lo I mean, community networks, asking the people to own the networks and they will understand it and they run it and they will not uh, sabotage the network. So that is important. For, for us to also look at. And uh, uh, last, not the least, local content. If I live in a community where they produce rice, 
The content I want to see is what the production of rice and also the marketing of my rice and uh, what variety, what can I do to improve my economic situation as a rice producer or a, yeah, a rice farmer? So th that local content is very, very key. So there's connectivity, as Melissa said, and content. And not, it's, it's not one or, so is both connectivity and content. There are a lot of things. Okay, if we even look at health sector, people want to, to get uh, diagnosed for, 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 for diseases that are not easily available, I mean, uh, treated within their community. So the, the, the content on the internet, on, on, on connectivity, should be able to solve people's, as long as you solve the local, local uh, uh, um, problems and issues, then people will desire to connect to the internet. Thank you for now. Thank you, Mary, for that insightful intervention. Uh, we're now moving over to Joanna. Uh, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm um, a bit puzzled. I've been a fan of Mary Uduma for a long time, and we did not coordinate notes, but I must admit that the points that Mary had just raised are on my list one by one. So what is left for me to do is to emphasize the need for regional capacity building. Now, I work at the university here in Lodz in Poland. My day job is capacity building. I focus on international law. I focus on security. I focus on human rights. So I'm going to emphasize these aspects. But the overall, the overarching point here is indeed capacity building something that Mary just emphasized in much detail and elaborated on with vivid examples. So I'm going to try and reiterate that point uh, with reference to specific areas where capacity building might be useful. Because of the pandemic, we largely rely on internet connectivity as we do here today. Keeping the networks safe is paramount, has always been, but has become forever more so the case since we do rely on internet connectivity. Keeping the network safe, however, means a lot of things. On one hand, it means national critical infrastructures. So connectivity that is safe as provided by large tech companies, national critical infrastructure operators. On the other hand, however, security means that the end user is safe and knows how to ensure that the device they are using, the websites they are visiting are secured. So when we talk about meaningful connectivity, ensuring connectivity, security comes at the top of that list. We can only ensure security when we ensure that the end user is aware of potential threats. When we talk about capacity building, this does come down to day-to-day -day end user education. It's the kids who need to be encouraged, I agree with Mary, to use the internet for the safety of their education, to be aware where the threats lie. But it is also the education of the uh, older generation. We had a panel here in Katowice yesterday that was focused on bringing online also those who are not digital natives. When we talk about organized capacity building platforms, I'm going to wear my GFCE hat, which is the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise. There is an Africa hub that has been launched recently by the GFC. There is a session tomorrow happening elaborating the standards for cybersecurity education. And that, as already noted, means a variety of issues, including that we educate end users in the regions what are the particular threats that they must be made aware of. And I just want to add another point with regards to building many meaningful connectivity and starting from day one. Also, the Council of Europe has a focused capacity building project called Glacy Plus that builds on getting new generations online and making sure that from that very beginning they remain safe. Safety comes with certain obligations, but it is the safeguard that ensures our rights. So I'm just going to toss in there that second leg 
of this debate, the second avenue that needs to be pursued. And these are individual rights and freedoms. When we do want to ensure meaningful communications, we need to make sure that that education includes also privacy concerns, as well as freedom of expression uh, standards. We will discuss a little bit more during the session, as I understand from the agenda, the power of service providers, platforms, if you will. So I'm just going to stop here, and I'm very excited to hear what other panelists have to say. Again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Joanna. So we're going to pause here and just open the floor uh, for questions, interventions from uh, the participants. Uh, as I mentioned, those online, you can post your question in the chat or use the hands up. Those in the floor, if they can put their hands up. Okay, I see a hand up in the floor. If you can just state your name and to whom you'd like to pose the question, or if it's a general question, thank you. I am Raja Asif Mahmood from Pakistan. And, and I want to know the solution for the third world, where the content local content is less available and the harmful content is more available and misuse of the internet is um, uh, wasting uh, huge budgets. Thank you. Would someone from the panel like to respond to this question? I've got one thing I can quickly say, and then I'll pass it over to my um, my co-panelists. But uh, so shukriya for your for your question, and salam alaikum. Um, I spent a lot of time in uh, Pakistan, specifically. I was there three times in uh, you know 2019, and you know I think that this is where I go back to: how do we enable local change makers to understand what's in front of them? What are the possibilities? when it comes to um, impacting the world in a, in, in a positive way. And I know that when I say positive, that can mean many different things to many different people. You know, whereas, you know, if I sit at home and in, in my culture, you know, someone might say, hey, this is fine. This is great. This is freedom of expression. And we might go somewhere else and say, no, this is, this is bad. This is harmful for, for young people. And I think uh, when it comes to the internet, it's hard to make that balance around, you know, what's good you know, versus, um, versus bad. But I think the key is really, um, you know, specifically in uh, developing countries, as well as around the world, how do we make sure that people understand their ability to have a voice? You know, and this could be as simple as how do you use social media in a positive way to create local content? One of the trainings that I often give is personal branding. And that's around how do you how do you understand what your individual superpowers are, and how do you you know take the mic, how do you take um, your voice and put it into something as as simple as LinkedIn or TikTok or Medium or something that may not require you know advanced technical skills. All the way through to, I look at an organization specifically in Pakistan called Circle Women, and they're doing some amazing work around how do you empower local women in local communities to understand how do they create content, how do they freelance, how do they um, make a business out of it versus just sharing their own you know, words so that it's not just, hey, how do I share my skills forward, how do I have a voice, but how do I make an income out of it as well? Uh, Paul? Paul? Yes, Mary. The yes, um, we have Kosi here, Dr. Kosi. He's one of the panelists as well. So remember to, to oh, okay. uh, ask him a question. But for the time being, there's another hand being raised. Do we allow Kosi or do we have the hands? Let, let, let's answer the hand. Sorry, I, I wasn't aware Kosi was with us. I apologize. Okay. Let, let's no answer, uh, answer the question first. Okay. All right. Continue. I have two hands here. Okay. Right. We have one on, on online as well. Can I can I go on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, my, my name. My name is uh, Naza Nicholas, and uh, I am the Tanzania Digital Inclusion Program Manager at uh, Internet Society Tanzania Chapter. And 
I would like to share what uh, we are doing in Tanzania in terms of uh, inclusivity. Um, we have created uh, uh, what we call women and uh, youth innovation hubs. And basically what uh, we are trying to address, we are trying to address the issue of uh, connectivity and uh, content uh, development. Um, this, this program uh, is a 20 years uh, uh, digital gaps, you know, bridging uh, and innovation program uh, in Tanzania. And uh, we, we are trying to create about uh, 200 uh, women and youth uh, uh, innovation hubs all over Tanzania. Given the level of uh, uh, expansive, uh, uh, or should I say, uh, uh, Tanzania is a very expansive uh, nation, almost uh, one, one million kilometer, square kilometer area. And uh, we have uh, about 169 um, districts and we are trying to, to create um, digital hubs in those areas. Uh, to close the digital divide uh, in rural and urban uh, places. And basically what we are trying to do is uh, try to have uh, communities you know, develop um, uh, a platform where they can share knowledge to solve the issues uh, using the local uh, knowledge, for example, uh, on the issue of climate change, uh, we think that uh, the indigenous knowledge is very key in terms of trying to, uh, uh, to create solutions for the, for, the, uh, for the climate change. And also having uh, uh, things like uh, digital uh, community libraries where uh, they can uh, uh, put content and share content and get the content from uh, the, uh, the, the National Library uh, so that they can also uh, go on and um, participate in e-learning where they can uh, uh, do the continuing uh, education from, from where they are. So basically what we are trying to do is uh, address the issue of connectivity gaps in rural and, and urban areas and also uh, the issue of um, uh, the internet multilingualism, where people can uh, actually share uh, content in local in local languages, uh, the issue of um, uh, digital skills is very key. That is also what we are trying to do: uh, ensure that women get uh, the digital skills that are necessary to make them not only safe online, but also be able to uh, acquire. Uh, entrepreneurial skills that are available all over the internet. And uh, we believe uh, with the uh, 6 million uh, young people and, and uh, women trained on digital skills that are, are important over the next 10 years, I think will go a long way to be able to empower and create capacity for our communities uh, in rural and, uh, and urban Tanzania. So that is basically what we are doing. Uh, the, this project is, is, is divided into, uh, like I said, uh, into two areas, women and youth uh, digital innovation hubs and internet for public schools uh, uh, projects. So, so we are trying to empower uh, the schools, the, the public schools that are underserved in rural and urban Tanzania and uh, so far, we have connected around uh, 10 schools uh, using uh, internet light equipment that uh, is, a, is a donation from uh, Basic uh, Internet Foundation, who is our partner. And we're also, also trying to bring uh, Facebook, which is Meta, to, 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 uh, to, to be able to work with us to connect uh, around 20 schools, uh, 20,000 schools over the next uh, 10 years. Thank you so much and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yes, for the sir. Mary, we, we, we have one hand up from the uh, Zoom. I'd like to give the floor to Kintudi first. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, um, Nick. It, I think it, it was really nice to to hear from the the uh, the man from Tanzania first because uh, my it's, it's more or less a, a question and an idea that I've been uh, thinking about, and I just want to put it out there to see what uh, any of the panelists think in terms of this. Uh, for one thing, the cyber war plan I think uh, makes a lot of sense, and it's something that I and a group of friends have been thinking about. You know. In terms of spreading the um, the need for capacity building for e-learning and for uh, training the young generation to learn more and have more access to uh, be able to learn uh, about uh, digital skills. Uh, but my question and my uh, this is just an idea I'm putting forward, and I would just want to ask uh, if what the any of the panelists think about it. I think um, in terms of uh, capacity building and uh, um, training our uh, young generation. To you know, be more content uh, creators than uh, content consumers, as uh, Melissa said. Um, I don't know if we could adopt uh, a system that is kind of already on ground in Nigeria, for instance. Uh, I do. I know a lot of countries or other countries also have the same in the educational system. Uh, we have a lot of schools, in especially secondary schools and even primary schools, that. Um, they have these societies, uh, they have literary societies, they have the uh, uh, engineering societies, science societies, and all that, who, you know, have regular activities, like weekly activities on a regular basis, and probably some other major activities, maybe uh, during the holidays. If this could be an avenue that we could tap into, is a plan I and a friend are working on, we are already, we're already building some ideas around it, you know, creating a kind of uh, internet society, for instance, or digital learning societies, in schools that we can syndicate across different uh, uh, schools across different regions as well, and use that as an access to continue to have access to these children or these students, and then continue you know, giving them access to be able to learn and also build themselves. You know, there are mentorship ideas that can work with this as well, and then use that to be something that you know it doesn't go away. It seems the society that is always going to be in the system. Once the children keep uh, uh, they keep coming into the schools to learn, they keep being part of this particular setup and continue to grow with it. And we can use that as, an, as a way to build the future generation uh, to learn more about you know, something like internet governance, for instance, which you know most people don't talk about enough and other aspects of our uh, digital space. Uh, I don't know if any of the have you know, a project that is close to something like this or I think in this direction, or if this is a good idea that can actually be used at all. Thank you. Do you want to go first or you want me to go? Yeah, yeah you can go first. Okay. Thank you very much. Access, access internet to education, learn more about what is internet in school, or permit students to have internet to learn their study and something like that is very important. It's very important for us in Africa, in rural area, in urban area, because when we have the position of government, something like we need to plan how our people will, need, will have internet and what they can do with internet. We have strategy, something like something like we have a national uh, universal access strategy, and to let people to have internet in health area education area, agriculture area, and something like that is important for them. Every time you are using internet to know, I'm using for what? Mm -hmm. Is to have knowledge, is to have, to do my business, and also to have information from government. We have platform to put information to citizens that is very important when we are making strategy to make internet for people. Thank you. So, um, um, don't, um, Wisdom still has a question to ask. Okay, last question. Thank yes, you. Um, thank you very much, Rooney. Uh, this is Wisdom Donko, the President and CEO of Africa Open Data and the Internet Research uh, Foundation. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, in that regard. So I have some few uh, observations uh, when it comes to community network in the developing countries. I think there are 
some few issues that we need uh, to, to address. Uh, Mary did mention some of them. Um, uh, local content, we need to uh, align some of this uh, local content to uh, economic activities, uh, depending on uh, the, the, the locality of that uh, community. And also, uh, when it comes to community network, the question that we normally ask is, is the government interested? Because um, government is also a business. They are also doing business. And then sometimes we have this uh, big uh, telcos who normally influence some of these uh, processes. If Vodafone, for example, doesn't see uh, the economic activity of certain areas, they wouldn't go. And then um, also it comes to uh, Lansing's spectrum allocation. You realize that all the spectrum that we have in Africa are being controlled by the big telcos. So we really need to look at that and see what we can do to address the issues. If um, maybe a small portion of uh, the spectrum can be allocated to non-governmental organizations, uh, that means that they can go in for such lancings and then start going into their communities and uh, 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 developing community networks. The TV white space looks like it's not working. The license is very expensive. Uh, so that also has to be, uh, we need to look at that. And then finally, um, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, cyber security and human rights uh, campaigns and all that, I think we are spending too much money in that uh, aspect. Uh, we need to channel some of those money into community network. Because if you are saying cyber security, you are building capacity where there is no network. So how do we secure ourselves? So we need to make sure we have those networks and then capacity can come in, then the human rights can come in. But for now, I think we need to channel more of those money into a community network. Uh, I'm not saying we should not do cyber security. We should do it, but when you look at Africa, we have those big organizations like the banks, they have money to do those cyber security. Government have money to do cyber security to secure it networks. Uh, other company organizations, they have those monies. And then you realize that government itself is spending more money on cyber security campaigns over areas where there is no network. And the human rights also come in with all those campaigns. Uh, so we really need to look at that. And finally, your initiative, I only heard you mention Uganda, Kenya. I didn't hear any initiative from West, Western Africa, Southern Africa, Africa, Northern Africa. So I only, yeah, I only included four examples, but okay. I could certainly spend a lot of time talking about my work in Tunisia, uh, South Africa, you know, activities that I've done in, uh, you know, Ethiopia and, and other countries. And there are so many other places I could mention, and I apologize. Yes. As we all know, Africa is a big place. Yes. And if I spent, you know, the next, let's say, half an hour, I, I probably would miss something about language, culture, religion, food. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, you're, you're never going to win. <laughs> But apologies uh, uh, for, for if I missed anyone's uh, location. Okay, uh, over to you, back, back to you, uh, Paul. And Thank you. We want, Thank to, you. We want to support the idea from the online uh, um, um, intervention. Uh, sorry if I missed the name. Uh, I think they are great, uh, great uh, initiative that we should also uh, look at. And Mary, we do have one more question in the room. Okay. If it's okay, Paul, uh, don't want to steal your thunder there. We, 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 we've actually running a little late. So if, okay. if we can, we, we can include that question in the next round of questions. Okay, that's uh, fine. Next so, round. Next round. Yes. Okay. Because we, we still have a bit of the program to follow. So I'm, I'm, I'm now going to pose the second policy question. And I'm going to pose this first to uh, Kossi. Kossi is with the government of uh, Benin. Uh, Apologies, Kosi, for not introducing you earlier. The policy question is practically, sorry, practical local driven policy solutions. 
what lessons can be drawn and how from successful policy solutions to universal access and meaningful connectivity around the world when taking into account local specificities and needs in particular what are the relevant practices implemented by local actors such as local government civil society local providers entrepreneurs to advance universal and meaningful access so Kosi, if i may pose that question to you first thank you we have many lessons to be learned when we talk about access and universal access to people we have to promote the initiative in regarding the, the capacity of each organization. Private sector sometimes have some initiative. NGO have also some initiative. They are coming for government. They, they don't come every time with the practical solution and showing we, we need to make this, we have this opportunity and we look for that money. Is it possible to get it in universal access fund, for example, to make it? We don't every time have some option like that. The option we have is something like, we have activity for our communities and we need money. We don't know exactly what kind of activity we, we done, what will be the impact of that activity for any of uh, all the citizens in the countries or in the area. For government, it's very difficult and to take a decision in that area. It's very difficult. When we have the problems like uh, electricity, we don't have electricity, we don't have water, we don't have a road in some place, it's difficult to say people need internet in the area where we don't have electricity. We, we're supposed to make first the solution for electricity before look at internet, look at any other thing. We need also to promote our economy. We, we need to promote our culture to, to, to the world. We're supposed to use internet for that. But step by step, we're supposed to make something before do another one. We, we have some NGOs who contribute to putting the connect a community network in the place in our countries. In Benin, for example, the license to, to have community network is free. To it's free to charge for, for NGO, it's free to charge. You have only to make declaration. We need to use that license to make network in our community. We, we regulator to the uh, operators, People need internet in this area. We can use one uh, percent of our universal access phone to let you go to the area and you build the network with the population with the area there. But some NGO can coordinate with that network, but in order to make benefits, in order to make profit. If it is to make profit, we, we, we be in challenge with the operator. That is not good. Operators are working on that. Thank you. Back to you, Paul. Th 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 thank you, Kosi. I'm, I'm, I'm now going to pass the, pose the same question to Joanna. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank so you. I'm working in reverse order now. <laughs> That is, that is fine, sir. Thank you very much. I am enjoying this discussion. Thank you, everyone, for the diversity of voices. Now, I'm going to focus on this question, and I do appreciate it because it is a very practical one. And I, myself, am a very pragmatic person. So I'm just going to point out existing initiatives that could help facilitate that regional, national, or local focus that is being mentioned through and through during this session. So I did mention I'm a fan of Mary, and that's because we both work within ICANN. We have ICANN uh, networks in place, but I do see many other ICANN colleagues in the room. So I would point to that platform where the African region, the Afralo, as we like to refer to it, has been very active. You guys do have strong community leaders 
who do what seems to be the most feasible thing with regard to ensuring meaningful, meaningful access. So what they do is they look at what others have done. And I'm going to use the example of cybersecurity policies or national infrastructure policies. And Africa coming online with the next billion, as we like to say, has the freedom of choice to opt in what they find is feasible. It seems as if there is a market of ideas out there and the African leaders can easily point you to experiences from other regions of the world which worked or which have not worked. This likely brings me back to the debate around service providers. We hosted this session with the Polish Foreign Ministry on Monday where we had the African perspective represented where it was emphasized that indeed it makes sense to get involved into internet governance dialogues like this one, like ICANN, like ISOC, the Internet Society. I regret that Jane could not join us here today for uh, utterly important personal reasons, but you did have Internet Society on the agenda. Internet Society does exactly that. It points you into the directions which have proven to work better somewhere else. So as much as the challenge of coming online is a vivid one, at the same time, it gives you an opportunity to select the solutions that are already available. And I would say that the way to get people active is to show them why it matters. You will decide what kind of connectivity comes into your area, into your town, your village, your city, ISOC is supporting wonderful projects with solar powered internet accessibility. So as much as there are infrastructure challenges, I'm going to argue that supporting the leaders, keeping your eyes open to ongoing dialogues and just picking what works for you would probably be the best uh, uh, way to proceed. And there are platforms as already said with ICANN, the IGF, the Council of Europe that I already mentioned, uh, that will help you facilitate engaging the local communities and emphasizing to them, again, going back to capacity building, why it matters to get involved, because you will be shaping the local internet, the bubble that will fuel those rice workers that Mary mentioned. I'm going to stop here. I'm really excited to hear other speakers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chasing to find the mute. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Uh, Mary, the floor is yours. Um, I think I have, out, I have outlined some of the practical ways I've said that one of the things I want to reemphasize is what Kosi said. There should be a synergy between the government and those that want to provide one thing or the other, whether it's a foundation, whether it's ISOC or uh, any, uh, any other group that is providing some, some um, uh, interventions. Um, our brother from uh, Tanzania has said, there's a foundation that is supporting them, but I don't know whether government is involved in it. Most times government don't understand what we're doing as civil society. So if we could, in Egypt, uh, one of the, the, the sessions we had in Egypt was the fact that at the office of the presidency or whichever, or prime minister, there is all those that will want to um, support Egypt. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, social corporate responsibility. There's a coordination. There's a synergy. So that we'll, not only that we will not repeat what others have said, done, but also coordinate to know, oh, OK, these are uh, communities that are, are express needs. So these needs, which, which, which uh, organization whether it's a local telecom, telco or is a foundation that would, so there should be coordination, there should be synergy. So that um, uh, there's a fact that uh, when MTN was doing school net, Ministry of Communication in Nigeria was doing school net, NCC, Nigerian Communications Commission was doing school net. Then another, another, another organization will come. So that coordination is not there. If we do it, whether it's capacity building or is uh, pure intervention on uh, on uh, on uh, infrastructure or trust or cyber security, there should be synergy. Digital cooperation at the local level is very very key. 
it's only that that will help us uh, get the, these things uh, ongoing and uh, we'll see results. So I want to support COSI on that because it's from government, you will be able to know when, when we from civil society are making a proposal. That, 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 but that might not be the vision of the government. But if we do a, a multi-stakeholder thing, if there's a platform to harmonize activities, if there's a, 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 a platform to synergize, I think we'll, we'll go far. Uh, that, that's my, my intervention for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, moving the floor to Melissa. So I'll just echo that, yeah, multi-stakeholder approach. I think we all know that, um, you know, and it doesn't always work, you know, in uh, in in all corners of the of the earth. Um, I want to reflect on um, something that we, um, as IBM, did with uh, the government of Cape Verde. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Cape Verde, small island state off of the west coast of of Africa, another location. I forgot that earlier, guys. Uh, so half a million people, small country. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to meet um, one of the leaders um, in uh, their, you know, one of their ministries at IGF, actually. Um, and he came up to me, this was in Berlin a couple of years ago. And he said, I'd love to do something in Cape Verde. Do you know where Cape Verde is? So of course, bring me to Cape Verde. Still haven't went to Cape Verde. That said, um, you know, we, we had this conversation around, you know, what could, um, you know, big tech, meaning IBM, what could IBM do to support Cape Verde and the government? And we looked across a number of different areas that they were focused on, um, you know, uh, building uh, capacity for, for youth in the area of digital skills, uh, building capacity in the area of um, entrepreneurship, looking at, you know, early stage entrepreneurs and how can we help them to build and, and scale. And so we came up with a number of different, you know, activities. And yesterday we um, had a design thinking session, you know, workshop uh, you can feel free to to check it out. Um, and we walked through, you know, how can you replicate this in your corner of the earth? We kicked it off by um, creating a national day of code. Um, we did that through the prime minister, through the prime minister's office, through the ministry of education, through the ministry of IT um, and their, you know, economic development team. We worked with the um, secretary of state who joined us in our talk yesterday. Um, and it went all the way up to the minister, you know, to the minister level, and it went down to the teachers, down to the students. Uh, we even brought, um, you know, some famous celebrities who are, you know, role models um, for young people to say, hey, you know, you might have thought that computer science wasn't for you young girl living in a village in Cape Verde. It is for you. And no, it's not all about math. And no, it's not too hard for you. And no, it's not for boys. And yeah, you can be an entrepreneur as well. Um, we did this whole entire takeover of the day. We did that in 2000, uh, 2019. We replicated it in, 2000, in 2020. And we kicked off a, a series of hackathons. We did a hackathon around looking at one of the local challenges in the country tourism. And we worked with the Ministry of Tourism to say, what kind of funding might you have available to provide a local entrepreneur with a really awesome idea? We did capacity building for the startups, taught them how to build pitch stacks, help them to practice their pitches, talk to them about you know, why startups fail. We brought in mentors from all over the world to help them look at their ideas, refine their ideas. We gave them cloud credits to help them build their solutions, to help them learn how to deploy on the cloud. And they ended up with, the winner ended up, ended up with a contract, actual money from the Ministry of Tourism to go out and execute their idea. You know, so I think there are many different things that can be done, um, but it's uh, often a, a localized solution that is specific for that country. That's what we did in Cape Verde. Um, you can obviously, again, check out the recording if you'd like to learn more, or um, I'm always happy to engage after, should anyone want to do a National Day of Code or other kind of uh, accommodating activities um, in collaboration with uh, my team. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, we're now going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, we have an online question. Uh, I don't know if there's any hands up. And we have some hands up here. So okay, the one let, let me just first. Okay, let, let, let me first take the online question, and then we'll move to the questions from the floor. Okay, uh, then 
Coyote, you, you have your hand up. Would you like to take the floor? Yes. Um, um, this is Kyrie from Africa Secretaria. Um, we have our summit holding currently, and it is as well broadcasting the IGS session to all the participants. So from the house here, we have uh, Mr. Inye Kemabonta, who is giving his intervention. I would like to post it on the chat, and then if it is possible, I can also read it out to uh, the participants. Please, Inye can we Kemabonta. take our questions okay. first? C C Cody, let, let, let's please. just post it to the chat, please, so we can continue with the session. Okay, Mary, can you, can you take a question from the floor? Can you please state your name first? And then uh, the, my, the name, question. my name is Resma Dongul. I'm from Nepal. And I'm an information or professional. So thank you for this uh, wonderful session. And uh, I'd love to, uh, I'm, I'm getting many learnings from this session. Thank you for that. And congratulations to panelists <laughs> for briefing uh, in detail. Like in my country, uh, I'm far happy that uh, like internet has been more accessible there. Like uh, during this pandemic time, like mo many students, uh, they used to have their um, classes ass and assignment uh, online. So many uh, younger uh, children uh, and adults have learned many uh, things uh, through this digitization. So as a information professional, we have to work uh, like 85% in the uh, internet only. Like we have to give uh, bibliographic information, cataloging this all. So uh, there's many uh, uh, like, uh, I'm happy that uh, Nepal is doing, uh, Nepal is growing in the internet. So we have last, uh, we had on September 2019, like Nepal IGF uh, internet forum was there in the Kathmandu. So I'm happy that at least Nepal is uh, doing many things, many things uh, in the internet. And we are going in the ground suit travel for the capacity building for the children's and uh, for the community people. And we are giving the education uh, for the social medias and that all who has illiterate, illiterate then also we are giving their trainings, uh, how to use uh, social media, how to get the education, uh, like for the elderly people also, how, how to use, you know, uh, they are far, um, uh, like uh, uh, they don't know how to in like for the Instagram and for Facebook and LinkedIn they don't know how to use but we are giving the trainings uh, like I'm the Secretary General of Nepal Library Association also so we are doing so many social works on that for using the internet to the ground suit level to uh, like all like we are doing massive things and still uh, I'm happy if uh, like uh, IBM will be uh, giving some um, uh, like trainings for in our country uh, through collaboration with our Ministry of Education, uh, Nepal Library Associations and some of my offices, then it will be like a great um, achievement for us in Nepal. Thank you. Sure, so happy to collaborate. We can uh, exchange details afterward. You know, I think um, I, I run coding camps and, um, you know, with my team all over the world. Um, and it's not just about, hey, how do you go out and become a computer scientist? Part of it is emotional intelligence, communication, um, you know, the basic building blocks of just being on uh, online all the way through to, um, you know, kind of how do you prepare for the future of work, you know, professional development skills, entrepreneurial thinking. Um, I kind of came up with this little thing called Dr. Sassy's trifecta of skills, but I'm happy to share those with you. And um, I've got a mobile application that should be coming out in, uh, in March. So we can talk more about that. Will it be in everyone's dialect? Definitely not. But, um, you know, slowly, uh, step by step with, uh, you know, open source technology, perhaps others can help to, you know, bring it to the forefront in their, you know, corners of the earth. Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, please we, just tell us we, your name and um, then. Okay, sure. So my name is Catherine Richard Kimambo. I'm from Tanzania. 
Um, I work with a foundation called Basic Internet Foundation, where we connect rural areas with internet. So the, our major project this year is school connectivity, which is a multi-stakeholder project. We involve the government, we work with mobile network operators, um, civil society organizations, the likes of content creators, and um, people who offer digital skills. But um, my comment rather is on the policy because that's, we have been a victim of, of, of policy for, for a long, long time. Um, so I would, I would really disagree with what uh, Mary and Kosi were saying because um, for the government, it feels as if we are letting the government off the hook when we say that they have to prioritize maybe something like building the roads or building the classrooms. But when really, most development stakeholders, when they come to a country, let's say as Tanzania, they would want to invest in, in, in ensuring that rural, rural areas are connected. But for my case in Tanzania, it took us something like one full year to have a permit even to go and install. So when we say when we, say we want partnership with the government, it's, so it could be not only about funding, it could be about the supportive mechanism. What are they putting in place for to support people who want to do connectivity in rural areas? I think Nazar can agree with me because most of the program, even getting a permit to go and install from the government is a problem. So that also being one of the biggest challenge in terms of policy. I, I remember we were given, we were about to receive um, donation of devices and um, we were heavily taxed as internet service providers. Imagine, because we are receiving a donation of tax. Exactly. So that's what, that's as, that is the biggest challenge so far because we went to, we are speaking with the Ministry of Education that the program is about education and we are receiving this. We are not making any profit out of it, but still they say, this is not our problem. Speak with the Ministry of ICT. We go to the Ministry of ICT, speak with the Ministry of Finance. So it's, we, we are just going around in circles and no one is willing to assist and the program is donor funded. So it's, I think it's about time for the government themselves to be accountable that we really, they really are speaking big about connectivity, but they're not doing something on the ground. It's we who, the, the grassroots organization that are really suffering from the consequences of policy. And um, what mechanism are they putting in place? That's, that is my take from this. It's hard. It's Horrible. so hard. I can echo that. I, when I worked at Microsoft, I had 400 laptops that I sent to um, Tunisia in collaboration with HP. It took me a year to get the, the contract done. It took me a year to get the contract done. By that time, you're, you know, you're, what, what device are you on now? You know, the devices are, are old. And I had to work with the Ministry of IT, the Ministry of ICT, and I had to work with like the Customs Bureau. And I had to have contracts with each of them. They didn't talk to one another. It was hard. And then what happened? I got them over there. I went and visited some of the schools. I'm not gonna comment on um, where some of those devices went, but I'm 100% sure they did not always end up into the hands of where they should have been. We've all seen that as well. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, can I? Yes. Uh, okay, we have another question um, uh, on site. Th th thank, thank you Mary. very much. And um, yes, um, just to add up, uh, especially the tax issue is one area that we relate to my name is Wisdom Donko from Ghana. Yes, the, the tax issue is something we really need to uh, look into because um, it looks like these days our government are beginning to shift their attention to um, the digital space. And in my country, for example, now everything about e-government, e-e-e, -E -E, government want to uh, begin to tax it. As I'm speaking now, parliament is arguing. The minority is saying no, the majority is saying yes. So they are arguing about uh, this electronic tax and, and all that. We really need to look at it when it comes to community network. And then um, I know a lot of people that have called me that if government is able to pass it, then they are going to stop using those digital devices. Already mobile money platforms are being taxed. And then they want to introduce another tax on mobile uh, uh, money. That means that the sender is going to be taxed. The one receiving the money is also going to be taxed on that same money. So these are issues. Yes, another thing that we also need to look out for is um, uh, issues of government uh, PPP. 
Yes, we, we really need to look at that because most often when it comes to government partnering private uh, sector, uh, and then they get a consultant, they bring all the consultant is come, uh, they bring consultant from outside, they come in, if they are executing the project, they don't even involve the local uh, community, they don't involve the grassroots, and then they finish their program, they leave, and then they, they expect we, the locals, to use that platform, then it turns to a white elephant and everybody looking at it because I've not been involved from the beginning. I'm not interested. So we really have to look at that. Yes, and when it comes to uh, you bringing the machines into the country, I've also experienced the same thing. I have initiative. And what we do is uh, connecting uh, schools We've been able to do a number of them throughout the whole country. And then we try to have a partner, a government, especially a Minister of Communicating, so that we have that tax exempt. And then it's been years now. It's been years now. But then we find our way, uh, our way out. And what we did was try to identify some of the Minister of uh, Parliament. And then we just tell them, we are coming to your constituency to come and do this project and we need to work with you. Once the MP from parliament gives that consent, then they, they own that project as yes, and then they, they move in and help you. And then that way you'll be able to avoid some of those uh, headaches and, 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 okay. and all that. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, this is what I, I can even share. Okay. Example, I used to work with government uh, in the Ministry of Communication and Agency. You know, in Ghana, we, we were able to lay fiber cable throughout the whole country, Ghana. Uh, that was with the previous government uh, under the leadership of Professor Queno. You know, he understands his community things. So we did that. But then after we leaving, after the previous government uh, leaving, and then a new government coming, and then that is where the issues also uh, started. So you realize that the policy that place that fiber there was ignored and then the fiber is lying down not being utilized yeah yeah thank thank, thank, thank you wisdom thank you we, we 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 have a couple of questions from the floor mary if we can go to sorry to the online online okay yeah. uh thank you um uh um paul uh, but uh, before we end we should allow kosi to defend himself because he has been challenged <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but, Kossi, but the, we... flo the floor is yours. Okay, Kossi. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, but government is not there to make problem for NGO or private sectors. All thing is process. All we think is process. We, when we need to make something with government, we came, we came with all the paper. Sometimes we, we, we came only with the paper who uh, can interest government. We don't say all things is outside. Government is supposed to know all because partnership is not free every time. It's not free every time. There are some uh, no deal outside. And you, you will get it. And after we will go to another negotiation, we will, we will talk we will tell to, to you, we will give you this thing. And I, I do you remember your people get this thing? Do you remember that? Is to let you support us here. Negotiation is not like that. We, we are looking for negotiation. All the time we are getting something, we are going to the project. We're supposed to have all the information around the project. That is very important for government. Okay, may I defend you, myself okay. that I said what, the synergy minute. will be at the highest level, not at the ministries. It should be at the office of the prime minister or the presidency. Thank you. That, thank you. Uh, we, we, we have three questions from, from the, the, the online participants. I'd, I'd first like to give the floor to India. Oh, oh uh, thank you. I, I had tried to comment much earlier when you were on the first policy question. 
but I assume that's past now. You might not be relevant. So, but I typed uh, a bit of what I wanted to speak about. Or well, would you still want me to talk? No, it's, it's fine. Feel free to to comment, if, even on the first policy question. One so, minute. No, the first policy question. Yes, I'll, I'll try to be brief, even though my texts were quite extensive. And your permission to turn off my video to uh, lessen the pressure on my uh, bandwidth, if you don't mind. Now, um, uh, fantastic interventions I heard about the policy question you posed. And it was clear to me that everyone understood the three A's, availability, affordability, and accessibility. But I thought when I listened to two, if not all the panelists, they hinted at a, a fourth one, which was content. But I, I say it should actually be appropriate content. And my, my point is, um, i give an example of Nigeria. There are over 150 million phones, almost the population of the whole country. Now, more than half of those phones are feature phones used for texts only. An MPN, against all predictions, as a major service provider, in six months, made so much profit, it even shocked them. They made so much profit in six months that were anticipated to have been for five years. Now with future phones and basic connectivity, not internet at all, but with the texting feature, what happened was that a certain need of the people had been served. Now, if we pick it up on that, looking at what the people want, want to be able to communicate, to, to connect, using simple feature of text messages. So innovators build solutions around texting so that Nigerians can now do financial transactions using text USSD codes. They can also access some level of educational content, learning content, using USSD codes. So many people are beginning to access financial data, educational material. What is left therefore is health material. And someone I know is also building solutions around that too, using ordinary text USSD codes to access doctors, for instance. Now, so what's my point? Appropriate content. I remember that Abo, the president of Afikta, used a maximum, maxim sometime when we spoke. He said, if you want a man to use a pencil, give him a paper to sign. Now, if the objective is to use the internet, that's the tool. So how do you make them use the internet? Now, let's take the paper to represent a check he needs to sign to cash his money. Let's take the paper to mean signing an agreement to give his child scholarship, educational scholarship. Let's take the paper he will sign to mean access to healthcare. Wouldn't he sign it? He would doesn't have a pencil. What you wanted to do was make him use a pencil. But you provide the content you know he's struggling with, he needs. So my, my recommendation therefore is African governments need to understand what they're struggling with, what the real needs are. And I mentioned three, health, education, and food. Now, if government were to their records and data, innovators will build solutions around to create the kind of solutions Nigerians need. I'll give you an example of the USSD code, which is an innovative intervention that enables Nigerians to transact financially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to take two more questions, quick, if we can, because we're, we're getting close to the end of this session. And then I just want to give the floor to our panelists just to give a final thought. Uh, Yusuf, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, first of all, thank you very much. This was uh, very informative. Uh, uh, this is Yusuf Kileo from Tanzania, a cyber security and digital forensics investigation expert. Actually, um, I want to, uh, uh, I heard a lot of uh, uh, people talking of capacity building, uh, spoke of awareness, spoke of challenges, 
that uh, probably the government is taxing this, is doing that. And uh, I've heard also of the story of misusing social media platforms have been used to brand uh, people, not to use them to brand themselves and so on. So um, my comment um, briefly, I would say that um, our African countries, most of the uh, challenge that we experience today is because of, of a few things, but uh, three major problems that we have. The first one is that we, 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 we mostly experience a lot of people with um, wrong skill sets uh, sitting in the right places. As a result, you find these people are not really uh, sure of what they want when it comes to ICT, internet governance, and so on. Uh, they do not really know how to push this agenda of, of, of ICT forward. As a result, you see uh, uh, we have things in Africa uh, that probably uh, are coming up or to, to, uh, to citizens and unfortunately mm -hmm. the same people start uh, uh, complaining that we are not really uh, uh, doing our things properly. So we have this as one of the very huge challenge. But second thing is that uh, 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 people in our African country and globally at large lack awareness. And when I say awareness, I mean that people are not aware that these are the things that the, uh, the internet can be beneficial to us in this particular area and so on and so on. Only thing that they see is that probably if you use the internet, you may, um, it's there only for entertainment, uh, utilize it in the wrong way, uh, publishing wrong things and doing things that they're probably not supposed to be done through internet and they end up abusing the internet. So lack of awareness. And that's why I normally call upon uh, governments from different mm -hmm. countries to make sure that at least they push this agenda of teaching our people or rising awareness to our people to understand that internet has a lot of benefits. One can utilize it to make money. One can utilize it to simplify things that they're doing, for example, communications, doing different activities and so on. But in addition, another challenge that I've seen in most of our African countries we really don't pay much attention when it comes to capacity building. Our people lack of knowledge. They really don't know um, things that they, uh, they, uh, they, they, they don't really acquire knowledge that we, need, we currently need for us to progress as, as nations in Africa. And of course, these happen to be a problem globally as well. So I would call upon these three things. To, and, and of course, I've heard the story of collaboration. I've seen that different countries uh, have similar problem where you go to a country, you find we have a lot of institutions. I've heard the lady from Nigeria, I, I believe, uh, from the panelist, uh, she mentioned about not collaborating from one point to another. So you find a different institution within the government. They don't really collaborate. They don't really share intelligence, share information. As a result, you see things are not moving the way we expect them to move. So this is something that I really call upon people uh, uh, that are attending this particular workshop uh, to, go with, to go out with. For example, I, I, I hope that when you go back to our, our countries to make sure that country now, I, I mean, uh, institution now will collaborate. Collaboration will be increased. We will have, we'll, we have to do the reforms to make sure that we put the right skill set to the right places. People who have will and wants to do these particular uh, jobs of ICT to make sure that our ICT is moving and also to raise awareness and to keep on uh, providing knowledge, capacity building to our people so that we can meet the needed target when, when these things are, are, are needed to be uh, reached some places. This is what I wanted to contribute from the discussion that I've heard. And I believe that it will be uh, impactful and people can be able to go back and implement this to bring changes to our countries and to stop complaining different things. Instead, we need to get things done and make the, uh, uh, these things moving the way we want them to move. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, we're coming close to the end. Um, I want to give the floor to Yusuf Ahmed, who's been waiting patiently online. Yusuf. All right. Good morning, everyone. From this side of the, yes. Okay. Yeah, my, mine would just be a kind of a comment and submission uh, to what we have been saying. A whole lot of people have spoken my mind, but I just want to uh, bring out a few points. Uh, where I think that uh, in Africa, mostly, you know, we have a, 
a big, big challenge, which if not targeted, if not properly dealt with, we might just be doing a lot of talk around without getting the necessary actions in place. And I kind of think that um, a government has a major role to play. Most often, uh, I, I would say, uh, in Africa, there's a iota of fear with government which is a fear of allowing people to understand what uh, the benefit of internet it really is. Because mostly when you talk about uh, people having access to internet, that is having access to uh, what really, really better their life, having access to how better, how best they can do things, uh, going against the primitive way of doing things, a better way of doing things. But there's this fear of replacement that cuts across government institutions, whereby a whole lot of people think that, okay, yes, uh, by the time that a digital technology comes into play in the government sector, a whole lot of people uh, would, might have to lose their jobs because it, they may have to be replaced with a digital experience, whereby people really don't want to learn and think into uh, what we have uh, today, that is the, uh, the, the world of today, uh, which also can cut across fear of freedom, freedom of, okay, a lot of people are being disenfranchised from getting this. I, I, I cannot think that it's a bit strategic for African leaders that are trying to make sure that a whole lot of people do not get access to the internet. Yes, and I, there needs to be a political will for it to work. Smart laws need to be put in place. We need to look for a very, very uh, a bold uh, legislators that have to put legislation in place to make sure that all of these laws support what we are talking about. And because most laws, uh, for instance, most laws in Africa, in context of my own country, if you look at it uh, side by side, very pursue, you would realize that most laws are targeted at generating revenue rather than going to the core of what they really should be. So I, I would just enjoy everyone that is in the government corridor, most especially in Africa, that it is the time for us to, uh, to put away all sense, of, uh, all sense of bias and make sure that we make uh, our internet accessible and approach and embrace the digital inclusiveness across board so that uh, the future generation will be happy about it. A whole lot of dreams have been shattered due to the political will uh, from that top and it cut across every strata. When I say every strata, from the federal to the state to the local government. So I cannot think that it is high time that uh, something is done about that. That's my comment, thank you. Th th thank you, Yusuf. I, I, I wish we had more time to continue this discussion, but we are right at the last couple of minutes. I don't know how the session will end, whether we get cut off, but I just want to give each of our panelists just uh, one minute, just to give a last passing thought. And I'd like to start uh, with Kosi, if I may. Kosi, just one minute, just to give a last thought. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, government need to have everybody on the board. We're supposed to collaborate and make the thing for our citizen. When we are talking about content, is not to go to the social media. Con social media is not the content for us. Content for us is the thing we can do for our education, for our health, for our agriculture, and so on on that. Or our culture, we're supposed to let the world know our culture. Our culture in Africa, me, I'm from Benin, Behanze country, I know, I, I let people know Behanze, who is Behanze? What thing if they do for the world? It's important for me. We're supposed to make all this together. Thank you. Okay, I've, I've been told we have one minute left. I just want to give uh, the floor to Joanna. I'll, uh, thank you very much. I'm honored and humbled. Just thank you for having me. And uh, just to commiserate with those who have been complaining about the quality of engagement, it's not just an African issue. We struggle with this. Uh, across the board. So uh, brainstorming sessions like this, I believe, are highly useful. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for having me. And I regret not being able to catch up on those coffee conversations that you guys will be having later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna. And, and then, Issa, 
online, just in case we get cut off, off online. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you comments. very much. Uh, I must say that, like other speakers said, there is need for, for collaboration between government, the private sector, and the NGO. And that government has a very key role to play in terms of driving universal access, the way it was done in Nigeria with the establishment of the institutions, Nigeria Communication Commission, the need there to do the policy, which at the moment has driven the 3G and the 4G technology uh, in terms of uh, mobile access. And another key thing that I want to say is that government must come online. By coming online, putting services online, it will drive traffic and it will ensure that citizens access the internet in order to access government services. Another key thing that I would like to say is this content development. We must build capacity in terms of content development. It's very critical and we must utilize the cloud technology that is available to create awareness for our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm gonna hand the floor to Mary and Melissa to close out there in case we get cut off. And thank you everybody for joining, just in case we get disconnected. I just want to say thank you to everybody. And uh, it's been a very exciting discussion. I've learned a lot and uh, uh, I, I want to see us a action on these things we have learned today. Thank you. So in closing, um, speaking of action, um, I'm easy to find in social media. It's uh, Dr. Melissa Sassy. If uh, you are an educator, if you are part of government, uh, an NGO working on capacity building in the area of digital skills or entrepreneurship, look me up, DM me, send me a, a message, and I'd love to see um, what I can individually do to take this from a conversation in this room or on Zoom or wherever you may join, may be joining from and turn it into actual action, actual impact. So maybe next year we can continue this conversation by bringing impacted individuals who have changed their lives through technology and been empowered by such capacity building efforts. Thank you. Okay, on that note then, I close this session. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the IGF. <laughs>